but a lot of people try to win volume through gaining high end. So the trick is like, how can I look for a frequency that is pumping in the right key? Wilder uh, learned how to play the piano. I think that was through my mom. She was very like, we have a very musical driven family. Uh, sisters who sing, um, do musicals and everything. But I actually started DJing on a computer. So I didn't even do it on like the turntables. I used, I'm not sure if you know Cool Edit Pro. That's for the real like, the real guys, it's back in the days. So you, you talk about Cool Edit 2000 and stuff. And that's where we like, it just, I sampled every sample I could sample from like DJ Jean, like a very famous like uh, Dutch DJ or like Scott Project, all like the German like house and trend stuff. And I sampled like hi-hats, claps, kicks, beats, loops. And I thought, oh wait, I like this vocal, I like this beat, I like this melody, and I just put them together in Cool Edit Pro. So I kind of started blending music, like beats and hi-hats, and then Wilder was always playing the keys. And then, so one day we just decided like, hey, wait, what if you, if we get a keyboard, and then, you know, we could start making our music for fun. So we asked our mom, because we were not very wealthy back then, hey, can we please have a, have a keyboard for like, uh, for Christmas, <laughs> and it's a long time ago. We were little kids, like 16 years old, 15 years old. So we got a keyboard, and that's how we all just started to play the keys, and I started to use every sample I had to put on top of those melodies, and that's how we kind of started. So I have no musical background. Wilder has, like, like uh, not know how to play keys, but I never knew how to mix, I never knew how to master, how to do anything. I, everything is, like, self-taught, and that's wow. kind of cool, actually. Yeah, it was mostly uh, mostly uh, sampling basically everything into like a uh, wave audio files. We never really used like the old school like uh, like high samples or anything. That came later when we figured out that was hap that was actually existed. But budget was a big thing back then. You know, uh, we didn't have any money for it. I was still going to school while I was going to school. We were worked at night like in a restaurant in a kitchen to make some money. So everything was uh, you know in between. But uh, yeah, like uh, everything, the, the funny part is like, even like our first songs were made in Cool Edit Pro all based on like putting samples together. Like we didn't even have a mixer. It was just like all like, like playing with levels and figuring out how to not store things or maybe accidentally to store things and make it sound cool. And uh, no, everything was based on this little old computer at my mom's like uh, attic, you know, the top floor of the house. It's so fun. And we still have the computer. And there's a lot of music on there that has never been released. And I, I had ideas to kind of go back into it and see what we kind of have. It would be awesome to find some really unique sample or something, you know. You know what's funny? And I'll, I'll tell you this. We start using it uh, more in the time we start to make EDM. So not during the hard style that much. Uh, because we had a different mixing table as well. But when we moved from the studios in Eindhoven to uh, a little village out of Eindhoven, we decided to get a new mixer. It was a DMX 100 and a digital mixing table. So it was like 48 channel, but 24 by like two sides. And then we, we started to add the Avalon too, because I think one of the guys at the music store said, this is a machine you can use for anything if you want to. But the idea is like, you know, you can use it for like a few things, but we just, well, everything went through that thing. Um, and I think especially the melodies, the show tech melodies, we really managed to get that really nasal frequency in there by just compressing the right like frequencies almost distorting it without clipping it and it's like, very hard to explain but like oh because like if you do it like internally like 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 digitally like it starts to almost become like uh, there's no headroom in it but i think with the avalon like you can go to a frequency and to a certain point where it's still crisp and clear and it's not like 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 dead you know what i mean so we like oh it works on this melody so we'd like bounce the melody through the table with the avalon like oh maybe it works on the vocals too let's see what we do here oh you know what let's try what i do was on a drum for example and and that machine just did a lot for us and it, it really gave us a signature kind of sound uh, that little like 10 15 percent different from other people were doing I and mean, i think i showed that people know us so i'm like because I gotta give some credit to my brother who is an amazing key player and comes up with mm, amazing riffs. But I think like if people think of Showtech, it's like, oh, you know, they make amazing party music, but they're always like, it's a kind of a carnival kind of melody. It's like, like almost like a fanfare we call it. Like it's more like, it's big, but it's not, not cheesy, but it's like very recognizable. But the secret behind it is that like, 
the the sound, the way we make the sound, is like we make everything from scratch. We sound, we literally start with an in it, and we start building it and building it. And sometimes we use 13 channels in like a virus DI and all send it through one output. So we just stack and stack and stack and through an Avalon. So and that way we were like, okay, this is really like the way we want to have it. So that machine really helped us like putting it everything together and give it like the final like sound. You know, that machine is this. And we still have it. We still have like three right now. What defines big, you know, because the thing is like a lot of these sounds are super like, uh, and I don't want to like talk bad about our producers or anything, but or who try to like, oh, I want to sound a little bit like show that let's try it. Often when I hear kind of those records, it, they, they still like sound like squeegee, like har like harsh. But if you play We Like to Party or Booyah on a big sound system, it doesn't bother your ears. So that the high end levels are very like limited. So in terms of like, it's like really hard, but a lot of people try to win volume through gaining high end. So the trick is like, how can I look for a frequency that is pumping in the right key? And so if you work on a certain key, so, you know, say you're in, in, in G or G sharp working, you know you're working in a 50, 50, uh, you know, 50 hertz frequency. So if you're going to have a melody where it's that, in that riff or a thing, we always kind of like look up like, okay, in which f frequency level are we actually working? Which spectrum are we winning and what spectrum are we losing things, right? So you can try to like push in a certain frequency, but if you're the syn synthetics behind the melody, so they like basically are not supporting that frequency, you can tweak whatever you want, but it's not in there. It's like basically like, I don't know, like, going to a restaurant and like you know like oh i want it to taste like garlic but there's no garlic in there it's like, it's like you know adding salt no you need to put like garlic in there if you want to taste like garlic you know so it's like how do we get that and i think it's knowledge and discovering why certain frequencies or certain like sounds work and why not and i think that's how we kind of manage it. okay first of all my brother is really good in like making it sound a certain way so the, the, the you know building a sound from scratch and then if you want to make it pumping and make it like like almost like like nasal like how we have it like, like booyah it's like da -da 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 -da. it's like almost annoying but it's not and it, it's not like if you play it like on the speaker it's like oh it sounds cool but it fills the entire room and then you gotta if you're gonna really analyze it, it's like how why is it filling the entire room it's not just the volume so we spend i'm not joking i think we spent like 72 hours on the reverb of that thing and it's like the reverb is like it's a sand it's like a layered sand on channel on on the melody and the reverb has also certain frequencies boosted or cut out so that's a very big trick we we give away right here <laughs> no but it's like that's how we do it so sometimes you cannot keep tweaking tweaking in the same channel so how are you going to win something if you just add another channel with a, a different kind of like sound design and it doesn't have to be necessarily be a new sound it could be the reverb and the reverb is gonna like fill up the room the same with a vocal like the reason why Billie Eilish sounds so incredible is because the person really knows how to work with the reverbs because if you take the reverb off Billie Eilish's vocal I mean don't get me wrong it's beautiful but the person who works with her reverbs really knows how to make her sound her voice come out it's not because her voice is like like, I mean, it's spectacular, but the, the way that's being produced makes it even more spectacular. And I think that's the trick that we learn ourselves is like, okay, how can we make this sound super cool? And well, so we, we work with reverbs, we work in a frequency spectrum, and my brother is good in making sounds from scratch. And I mean, that's just like, I mean, that's like something that he really taught himself for years and years and years. And to know, okay, I want to make this sound, how do I make it? For a lot of people, it's like, okay, let's just go through some sound banks, see if I can find it. That's not how we work. We're like, okay, how, how, what, what kind of sound are we doing? Okay, and then we just start, and then we're building it from there. So it's like, we might layer it with like a little sand layer or whatever, or like a little other, other sound. It's like, oh, this works well with it. But 95% of the time, it's 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 handmade. It's also with stereo imaging and stuff. Like, you, how can I win like volume? And sometimes going to mono is is might be takes too much room. You know, and there's also reasons why uh, a kick is mono, for example, and, and some leads are not. Like you have to kind of understand in the spectrum where you want to work in. And sometimes you have to go outside the box and it kind of works like magically. Like, whoa, wow, this works. 
but you know if you do sound design and you're like trying to make a cool sound like the, the lead from Buya for example if you if you go to the to mono stereo imaging it's not crazy stereo but just enough to give it like a little bit of like balls and it's mostly in the reverb and the, the lead itself is not super stereo just a little bit enough to to not if you press mono stereo it stays in the middle but then the reverb gives it like it's like a in a, like a jacket you know that's how it is i mean people sometimes ask us like oh, are you still going to make hard style and then our answer is like yeah but our albums are still there is it necessarily going to be better if we still do hard style can you really beat fts can you really beat like colors of the harder stuff can you really make it better than what we did in the, that era so and we are very like true to ourselves and like if you're in a in a relationship and with whoever with a friend or your partner or whatever and it's not working anymore or you want something else you got to talk about it or you got to change something in your life to get what you want and for us like like back then hardstyle was everything to us and it still means a lot to us it's still us the the, the the beating heart of our career right because of hardstyle we became like I mean, don't want to brag, but we did fucking well, you know? And we toured the whole world, we sold out concerts, solo shows everywhere. But at some point we were like, oh, I want something new. And that was the artist like in us. We were working with Chesto behind the scene and we were like, oh wait, we're making music with this guy. It works. Uh, we want to try something for ourselves. And we just one day decided to make something else. And then we just loaded a gun with a lot of bullets and they all kind of hit back then, you know, Booyah and Cannonball and Bad and slow down it's just like we're like just going and then we're like okay and uh you know we worked with like a lot of cool artists that i when i was 16 never thought i would work with like major laser and stuff like to me that was like super cool for us to do and david Guetta. and now like the pandemic happened and we're like okay you know what this is also a time and a moment in our lives where we can really think of like what's gonna give us a, give us that same energy that we had when we did Hardstyle or when we had like our records like uh, you know I, I remember when we, we released Booyah and I didn't, didn't even send it to Calvin Harris he just played it at Coachella I, it was like the biggest promo we ever had without even sending it out to him and that energy like that that vibe that atmosphere was like oh really like okay we were doing something and it's being it's picking up right and then in the, in the pandemic we thought okay you know what I was actually recovering from a knee surgery we thought, you know, let's just take a few steps back and see what we kind of did. And it's also very important as an artist, and I actually just talked about it with Ben, is that like, you're always, when you're doing things and you're traveling and you're making music and you're always living on a hype, right? It's always like, it's like always being in the gym. It's like, you're always pumped, no matter what you do. It's like, you talk about music in an interview or you're doing a meet and greet or you're doing a show. The only time when you can really reflect what's happening, you're sleeping because you need to recover, you know? And then the pandemic hit and it's all this noise. And I'm not saying it's all noise, but it was a lot of things happening. Kind of like, oh, it's like, kind of like made us like sit back a little bit and like, look, look what we really want to do. And I think now it's like, we took really a lot of time to work on a new album. But I also don't want to like be like the same person that people always want us to be. I also kind of want to have the, able, the ability to grow. And I think as an artist, that's the reason why we're artists. Like we want to have that freedom. Like, you know, if I want to make a painting, I don't want to paint what people want to have on their wall. I want to paint something that I'm proud of and I just hope that people like it as much as I do. And if you, that's art, you hate it or you love it. I'm not. You know, not everybody's fan of Kanye West or Drake or, you know, you just, you don't like it or not. And maybe you like some of it or not. I think that's totally fine too. So the new album, what we're trying to work on in the end, uh, we're hopefully, we, we had it actually, it was kind of weird. We had it actually almost ready last year, but this, this pandemic just didn't stop. And we're like, why are we dropping an album if we can't tour? Like, I want to like, if we just, it was like an elastic holding, 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 and, I, we, and we want to shoot it, but then if there's no tour, there's no support to really go play for fans. That's the best reaction we have because fans are basically our audience and they are the reason why we kind of do this. So why would we release music and we don't see the interaction with the fans? So uh, we waited and we waited, but over time we also get new music. So this little list of 20, 25 songs became like 59 tracks. So I was actually sitting down with my brother and we had this conversation with the labels like, okay, we need to go from 59 to like 15 at least. And we can always add some, but 
go from 59 to 15 if you already decide to work with certain writers and producers and everybody's excited like fuck but I noticed from working with David you know we worked a lot with Big Baguetta and he had like I remember one day we were talking about his album he's like oh I got like 300 songs I'm like what? 300 songs? Like what? Like oh yeah I'm just like I'm just working so many songs right now I'm like oh my god like you know, I never understood but if you just always work on music and you actually have the time for it uh, and that was the reason why, you know, I want to say the touring was amazing and stuff, but it also kind of takes away to really see what you need for your brand, but also for your for your personal life, because the brand is basically a translation of your identity and your person, who you are as a person. So if you can't really find yourself anymore because of everything around you was happening, and even though those are, those are great things, you're always kind of looking at the next thing, but you're never really living like in the moment to see what you really need to do. And I think that that's really good that, that uh, in the last two years, we were able to sit back, listen to some music, evaluate it, put it away for two weeks, go back. I really have a different approach on the work that we've been doing. And uh, Wilder has also been working nonstop in the studio. So I think we are very confident that by the next couple of months, we have a really some really cool stuff ready. And um, I'm excited to, to play it because it's also not really super typical so it's like but it's kind of cool to always reinvent yourself a little bit you know without losing the, who you are of course but you know if we're talking about production like do we always have to sound the same in terms of sound design because if we play a song oh it sounds a show tech but on some point it's like yeah but does it mean i can only produce this in this box of like how it should sound do we always have to use this reverb and this blanket to make it recognizable or can we just do something else so now we are like okay how we we maybe it's just now we would want to work with different vocals than we used to do and still use like some tricks that we do or like some plugins like some plugins that we use we will never stop using them because they're just like i just click them and i know how really easy how to make you know like our presets basically so it it's still easy for us to kind of like uh, go a certain direction by using a certain tricks and producing and still sound uh, a certain way but maybe we just different elements this time so yeah super super excited and uh, i think Wado and i really use these last two years pretty well to uh, kind of like reflect who we are what we want to do we're still young you know and we have got we got many years to go and to go and so it's i think it's very important as an artist sometimes to like take your time and to really do something that is going to create like a new wave or something like that so yeah super excited i think there's a lot of different directions we can go in, into for answering that question i always say there's like there's this it's, it's kind of funny and i think it's like first of all if somebody t says no it doesn't mean it's not good you know and also if you release this I, there's a few things i want to say if you're a producer and, we, and you drop a song and it's not being recognized or not being played yet or not picked up the way you hoped for I still it's very important that the number one supporter of your product is you yourself. If you lose that, then you're just going to be desperate and like going from left to right, front to back. You need to be solid in your decisions. Like this is my track, I fucking love it. Sorry for my language. And if the results not there in terms of streams or whatever, it doesn't mean it's not good. There's like 24 million I don't know songs uploaded on Spotify every day. Too many. It's almost for anybody it's hard to be seen these days so don't for producers i would say be proud of your product and when the time is right it will go come through uh but you gotta hustle to get it done you know and if it doesn't if it doesn't show on spotify you might just have to literally physically drop off your usb stick in a club and go see the dj and tell him to play because that's what i did for like like when fat legram was still a local resident dj in Eindhoven, where we're from, I literally gave him my CD when I was 16 years old. I sneaked myself into the club with a fake ID card or whatever, and I gave him my CD and told him to play it. And two weeks later, he played the song while I was like not even old enough to go clubbing. So there's always a certain hustle you have to have, but I, I, I want to say be really confident in the music you make. And secondly, you want to say, so if somebody says no, it doesn't mean it's not good, but you got to be open-minded for, for other, like, inputs from other people it doesn't mean you have to change your mind but like we were very stubborn when we were producing we thought we could do everything ourselves until we met other producers and other writers and we're like oh wait if we make our team bigger you know and everybody gets a little bit of the pie it also means the pie can go bigger so open for growth be open for growth and for the rest have fun that's the most important part have fun in your work 
and don't get depressed. Uh, if things don't work out, just enjoy the process.